everyone, welcome to Real Life 101, the show where you'll get the inside scoop on real jobs, great career choices. I'm your host, Jillian, and I can't wait to show you the lineup of careers we have in store for you today. What comes to mind when you think of anthropology? Bet you never thought of fast food. You won't want to miss Gracie's informative interview with an anthropologist. Then Sean will talk with a marketing engineer who works to make sure her customers' energy needs are met. And then Gracie will visit a fire station where she'll talk to a firefighter and learn that this job is not just about extinguishing fires. Stay tuned for all this and more today on today's episode of Real Life 101. Our first career is often misunderstood, and some even call it irrelevant. Well, listen up, people. The research of anthropologists has a major effect in many areas of our lives, from health to tourism to food to infant learning. Gracie visited the University of Central Florida's Department of Anthropology, where Dr. Ty Matioski, Associate Professor and Graduate Coordinator, shared with her how anthropologists help us understand the world in which we live. We're here with Dr. Ty Matioski. Dr. Matioski, what exactly do you do as an anthropologist? Well, as an anthropologist, uh, one of my jobs is to uh, study humans. Uh, so in the broadest sense, anthropology is the study of humankind. Anthropologists are interested in studying all aspects of what it means to be human. So they're interested in humans as cultural beings and physical beings. Now, do you only study people of the past? Uh, no, anthropologists study both people of the past and the present. Myself, I'm a cultural anthropologist and I study populations uh, in a contemporary sense. Uh, so much of my field work takes place uh, in the Philippines. So what does your work look like when you're, you're studying these people? What are you looking at? Uh, I'm interested in all aspects of their culture. Um, so uh, in, in, in my specific case, I'm really interested in uh, foodways and globalization. Uh, so how do the intersections of uh, local foodways uh, with kind of more uh, what we would term modern fast food, uh, how those are expressed in a local context. So uh, for me, I'm interested in what happens when uh, McDonald's opens up in the provincial Philippines and how uh, local consumers uh, consume or produce these type of uh, food items. So once you've researched um, everything, what what do you do further with your work? Yeah, that's uh, the field work is the one component of our work. The next uh, component is where we actually do uh, research analysis, looking for patterns, looking for themes, analyzing the data, and then we organize it uh, and write it up into publications that we send out uh, to various peer-reviewed journals, and uh, hopefully uh, they get picked up and published. How does your research in these articles help our world today? Oh, they actually show um, what occurs abroad. Uh, they, they show uh, some of the uh, kind of aspects that, you know, maybe general mainstream audiences don't uh, give as much uh, thought to. So one of the benefits of anthropology is uh, they study phenomenon in its natural setting as it's locally occurring. Unlike journalists who maybe would go to a, a, a locale and study something for a brief period of time, uh, anthropologists are there for extended periods of time. So through things like participant observation, uh, they're able to really kind of uh, integrate themselves into, and almost live like a local. So sometimes they take what we would call an insider's uh, native perspective. And so that's one of the benefits of anthropology is that uh, they can actually uh, give kind of an in-depth understanding of local cultures. And sometimes uh, practices or, or traditions that uh, are maybe misunderstood. 
So what type of education is needed to be um, considered an anthropologist? To become a professional anthropologist, it's pretty much a foregone conclusion that you have to have a graduate degree. Uh, so in order to work in the field, the expectations is either you would have a master's degree or uh, optimally a PhD. How long does that take? Yeah, that, it's a, a very uh, long time. It's an extended amount of education. So, uh, you know, beyond your bachelor's degree, you could expect uh, maybe another six, seven, sometimes eight years. What made you want to enter this field? Okay, well, I kind of knew what I didn't want to do, and I knew that uh, I was always intellectually curious, curious about other cultures, other ways of living. Uh, I initially started out as a history major, but I saw that anthropology was perhaps a little bit more hands-on, uh, so that kind of steered me in the direction of anthropology. Uh, once I started taking classes in it, I really thought that this was a good fit for me, and once I got the opportunity to go abroad to the Philippines to study, uh, it was pretty much a foregone conclusion that I would become an anthropologist. Well, thank you so much for your time and for sharing more about anthropology. What a fascinating field. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. There are four subfields in anthropology, cultural, biological, linguistic, and archaeology. Dr. Matioski is a cultural anthropologist. Biological or physical anthropologists search to understand how people adapt to different environments, what causes disease and early death, and how humans have evolved over time. Linguistic anthropologist studies the ways many people communicate around the world. Archaeologists study human culture by analyzing objects or artifacts people have made over the years. To learn about the many areas in which anthropologists are employed and the different effects they have on our world, check out the link to the American Anthropological Association on today's episode synopsis at rl101.com. Maybe you too will be steered to enter this fascinating and very relevant career field. Be sure to stay with us for more Real Life. Break time is over. Let's get back to the show. Okay, girls and guys, there's a major industry that is expected to have an employee shortage in the next few years, just when some of you high school students will be graduating from college. Can you guess what it is? The science and engineering industry. There are a myriad of job opportunities projected in different fields. For example, Brittany Nottingham is a marketing engineer at ABB, one of the world's largest engineering firms. The company specializes in power and automation technology. Brittany told Sean how she explains technical concepts in lay terms to their customers. What's up guys? Today we're here with Brittany and she's a marketing engineer. So tell me a little bit what we should do. Well, a marketing engineer means I get outside specifications for people that want to uh, have equipment such as a big gray box right behind us. Um, they they uh, send in a specification, their single line drawings, that sort of thing. I take those, I know our product line, I know the industry standards, and then I put together a proposal for them that will fit their application. Now what was like one of your passions when you were younger? Because I know you weren't always thinking about being an engineer. Um, well, my passions when I was younger, I, I was always like technically curious, I guess. Okay. You know, I would get um, gifts and stuff when I was a kid, toys, and take them apart. I used to make my dad so mad because he would give me a toy, I would take it apart, and then have to put it back together. And I guess it kind of tipped him off that it might be a good career for me. And he was actually the one that mentioned it. He was like, hey, you know, you've always enjoyed math and science, and you know, you were always taking stuff apart as a kid, so how about you go try this out? Hey, now, what kind of education did you have to go to, to uh, get into this field? Um, I had to go through four years of college um, yes. to get a bachelor's of science in engineering. Um, I, my particular field is electrical engineering. Mm -hmm. um, so I was, I went to the University of Central Florida for uh, four years, got my degree there, and I'm here. <laughs> do you work in a big team or do you work by yourself all the time? There are five of us in okay. our team. Um, we have three on the eastern half of the United States and two on the western half. Um, so it's really just me and my partner uh, rooming in, in the western half and it's, it's pretty fun. You know, we, we ping pong off of each other and it helps having more than one person. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Now tell me um, how the process goes when you're actually meeting with the client. Like what's the situation? How's that work? Well, normally when I go for customer visits, I mean, they have questions, you know, we're introducing a new product or maybe they have, we have a technology that they want to learn more about. Of course. Then, then I will go, um, I already have my presentation prepared, what they want to learn about. 
Uh, I'll go in and normally do a formal presentation um, just to go over the technology and pull out our slide decks and all that fun stuff. And then after that, um, I can sit down with them and discuss maybe a specific project. So it goes from general to very specific project and will this work in my application? So what kind of qualities or attributes do you think a person needs to have of your kind of job? Um, I think curiosity is probably the biggest part because there are things every day where people say, can we do this? And I was like, well, you know, I don't know. Well, maybe I'll go explore and do this and do that. Um, so I think curiosity is one. Um, people skills, being able to go out and talk to people, not being able or not being afraid to go out and stand in front of somebody and say, hey, this is what I do. This is what our product is. Ask me what you want, you know. Um, and also having kind of that technical mind, being able to visualize things in your head, it, it really helps a lot. So, uh, if you had to choose one thing, what would be the uh, favorite part of your job? Um, my favorite part of my job is when I get one of those special projects where they ask for something off the wall, and I get to work with everybody in this whole organization to, you know, pull something together and be like, well, what can we do, and push the boundaries a little bit. I, I really enjoy doing that. Excellent. Talking about different types of engineering in this company, how many types of engineers can you do? Like a lot, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. There's, I mean, civil, electrical, mechanical. Um, I'm sure we probably have a few nuke engineers here, chemical engineers, I know there's a few. So, I mean, there's so many different types and, and different schools offer different types of engineering and one school may offer all of them or some of them or, you know, it really just depends. Now, if there's someone watching that might want to become an engineer like yourself or maybe a different type of engineer, what is something they can start doing today to like, kind of prepare themselves? Um, well, what I did is I took a lot of um, advanced placement mathematics and that really helped out a lot because in the, when you get into college and stuff like that, uh, for engineering you have so many math prerequisites mm -hmm. that sometimes if you don't have, you know, at least pre-calc or, you know, calc one or something like that, then it can kind of push back your timeline. You can stay in school for a little bit longer without those prereqs. Okay. So it, it can go from four years to six years very quickly. So having the math and the sciences, uh, AP physics is a great one to have. Um, those are all wonderful because then you're kind of a step ahead when you get in school. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for talking to me. It was a pleasure meeting you and keep up your work. Thanks. Sounds like Brittany is almost like a translator of sorts. By using her electrical engineering knowledge and her people skills, she is a valuable connector in assisting ABB's customers with their power needs. What a great job for a person with an engineering degree who would enjoy getting out and working with customers. ABB has a variety of job opportunities around the world for qualified graduates. They also award scholarships at universities in other countries in addition to internships and work experience. If you'd like to explore a future at ABB and see the opportunities the company offers, check out their student link on today's episode synopsis at rl101.com. If you are interested in the first two careers we just featured, you're going to want to get into a good college. After researching schools to attend, it would be a shame to not get into your first choice due to a low SAT score. How do you get prepared? Well, we've got some resources on our website at rl101.com to help you. Click on the College Info tab and you'll find information, practice tests, and tips for taking the SAT and ACT. Check them out. And don't let low test scores keep you from getting into the college of your choice. I need a break. How about you? Be back in a few. We're back. Extinguishing blazing fires, rescuing people from burning buildings, being heralded on the evening news as a hero, this is what a lot of kids envision when they think of our next career. But is this what the career of a firefighter is really like? How much time do they actually spend in action, and what do they do when they're not fighting fires? Gracie found all this out and more when she spoke with Chris Acapinti, a firefighter and EMT with the East Naples Fire Control and Rescue Department. We're here with firefighter and EMT Chris Acapinti. Chris, what do you do day to day as a firefighter and an EMT? Well, our job requires us to do a lot of training, so we train every week. Um, either on firefighting skills or medical skills. So my schedule is I work every third day, so I work about twice a week, 24-hour shifts, and one of those days will be a training day, and the other day will be a either truck day or station day, where we just clean the truck or the station a little more than the regular everyday routine. 
So what exactly is an EMT? An EMT is an emergency medical technician. What this allows me to do is perform basic medical tasks out in the field during emergencies. And what type of training do you need to be an EMT? To be an EMT, it is uh, different from state to state, but in the state of Florida, it requires uh, about a semester of schooling uh, with some prerequisites. And as far as a firefighter, what does that training look like? Well, as far as a firefighter, you need to go to the fire academy, which is about six months long, and at the end of that, you have to pass a state test to get certified. Uh, and this test includes both physical and written activities, um, and it's a two-day event when you do go to take your test. So do the two typically go hand in hand? Yeah, there's no laws requiring a firefighter to be an EMT or a paramedic, but very few departments will hire someone who is an at least an EMT because that's such a large portion of our job. So do people typically um, go to both different trainings back to back? They do, and sometimes, depending on where you live, uh, there's a waiting list to get into the fire academy. So some people will get on the waiting list for the fire academy and then go get their EMT and paramedic certifications while they're waiting for their names to come down on the list. Is there some sort of an application process to get into the fire academy? There is, uh, and although it varies from place to place, um, when I went through the academy, uh, basically you went in, got your name on the list, every six months they would send out packets to everyone on the list, and at the time, it's whoever got the packet filled out and their physical exam done back first with the money, because it does cost money, um, will get into the academy. Since then, they've changed a little bit where they'll send out just to the first 20 to 25 people uh, packets, see who replies, and then whatever the remainder is, send it out because there's, they only accept 25 people in each class. So you need to be proactive. Yes, you have to be on the ball. You have to be ready. When your name comes up, you have to go out and get everything you need to get done because if you hesitate, someone else is going to take your spot because there's a lot of people waiting to get into the academy. What made you want to become a firefighter and EMT? Um, before this, I was working in office jobs sitting at a desk, and I wanted something a little more exciting, something that just got me out of the office and outside more, and also something that I felt was helping my community. Now, I think it's every child's dream to grow up and be a firefighter and save everyone. Um, what are some of the day-to-day -day things that you really deal with? Uh, as I said earlier, uh, medical is a big portion of our job. Uh, and over half of our calls are medical calls. Anywhere from vehicle accidents to people who are fall and get hurt at home to people who are just too sick to drive themselves to the hospital. What do you think are some of the most important characteristics one needs to become a firefighter? You have to be quick on your feet. You have to be confident. You can't be hesitant because when it's time to act, you have to act. You don't have time to sit there and think, uh, you know, how are we going to do this? It's kind of like, we just need to do this, we need to work as a team. So being part of a team is important. You have to be a good team player. Um, I work with, on each truck we have three guys, and at each station we might have more than one truck. So, and you spend 24 hours at a time with these guys, and a majority, the majority of that time you're actually together. You're not just there, you're working together. So you form close bonds with these guys, and you just have to be willing to work with these guys, and and just be close with them. And if you can't get along and you can't work as a team, you're not gonna last very long in this career. Wow. So what advice would you give someone that's interested in entering this field? Um, well, you do need a high school diploma or a GED. Uh, and then you're going to have to go into the academy and stuff like that, which, as I said, is physically demanding. So you definitely want to be physically ready, both strength and cardio, and again, a large portion of our job is medical, so you're going to have to be willing to learn the medical stuff, so you're going to have to get ready for a lot of schooling. Well, Chris, thank you so much for teaching us more about what it means to be a firefighter and an EMT, and thank you so much for your service. Well, thank you for so much for coming by and joining me today. About two-thirds of fire departments are staffed with volunteer firefighters as opposed to paid firefighters. In addition to the various certifications fire departments want their applicants to have, prior experience as a volunteer firefighter is a big factor in landing a paid position. Interested in learning more? Then check out the link on how to become a professional firefighter published by the International Association of Firefighters on today's episode synopsis at rl101.com. 
We've got more for you right after this break. Break time is over. Let's get back to the show. It's time to bring our episode to a close. Hope you got some new ideas of what to do with your future life. We've got more exciting career ideas for you next week. Animals get cancer just like people do. We'll meet a veterinarian who specializes in diagnosing and treating pets who have this dreaded disease. And for you aspiring musicians, we'll introduce you to a man who makes his living as a freelance drummer. Then we'll take a trip to the zoo and check out the gators and meet the brave zookeeper who feeds them and keeps them healthy. Thanks for joining us today. See you next time on Real Life 101, where we will provide you even more solutions to that job dilemma bouncing around your head. It's your life. What career will you choose?